Well, that was fun. Good golly, Miss Molly. The UK know how to watch a pay-per-view, and it helps when the pay-per-view is bloody aces. Despite Money in the Bank continuing WWE's run of doing stellar shows in underrun territories, we do still have some quibbles. So in the interest of balance, I'm Adam from WrestleTalk, and here are the five best and five worst decisions made at Money in the Bank. Best number one, J. Bind Roman. Over 150 talent and staff releases, five Charlotte Flair title reigns, and a global pandemic. These are just a small sample of the things that have happened in the three and a half years since Roman Reigns last had his shoulders pinned to the mat. We doubted whether the Bloodline saga had anything left in it after Mania, yet here we are, discussing maybe its highest ever point. And that simply wouldn't have been the case if Jay had pinned Solo and Money in the Bank. No, it had to be Roman. And we feel like the Empire is crumbling right now, and we have to feel that SummerSlam is going to be the stage for Jay and Roman to happen. Will it? Yes. Will Jay win? Probably not. We all know that this train is likely going to keep rolling one way or another until Mania 40, but we do have belief now. We've seen it with our very own eyes. Roman can be pinned. And even better, we've seen that Jay can be the one to do so. Vindication! Worst number one, LA Knight didn't win. Now, this one does admittedly still sting a week later. I mean, genuinely everyone and their mum wanted LA Knight to claim that Money in the Bank briefcase. The roof of the O2 was absolutely set to be blown right off its hinges. It didn't happen. Similarly to when Cody lost at WrestleMania, the initial knee-jerk reaction was, of course, rage and abandon all hope. Yet, as I mentioned in the last entry, perhaps we can, at least for now, give WWE the benefit of the doubt. We doubt them with the bloodline. They've turned that ship around, so maybe there's an even bigger plan for Knight down the road, he says, pretending like the same wasn't said for Zack Ryder, Rusev, and Cesaro, all of who were our guys but never got the push they deserved. I pray that Knight doesn't also fall into that category when we reflect in five to ten years' time. Hopefully, there's still hope for the megastar to reach mega heights in WWE yet. Yeah! I can't... Yeah! How does he say? Yeah. Best number two, Damien Priest won. Now, I may be disappointed WWE didn't pull the trigger on Knight. Sure, I, I like big pops as much as anyone else. But that does not mean I think Damien Priest was a bad choice to win Money in the Bank. From a storyline standpoint, he's the best choice. And a backlash, he's more than earned it. Not only has Priest been putting in great work with the Judgment Day for the last year, basically, but he's also developed something that can't quite be taught, as Enzo Amore would say. That's just top guy aura, a quality I can't quite explain, but he has it. So I'm not mad about Priest winning. In fact, it's great, not only due to his recent work, but more importantly, all the tantalizing possibilities with his cash-in. We've already seen a bit of that wedge between Priest and Finn Balor, so will Priest back off to let Balor get his seven years worth of revenge on Seth Rollins? Or will he wait till Balor loses again to cash in? Will he, and this would be really cruel, wait till Balor eventually wins and then cash in immediately after that? Many exciting possibilities, and for that, Priest was a rightful winner at the pay-per-view. Worst number two, Shayna's turn on Ronda. While Priest wins seems like a well-thought-out move on WWE's part, and you can see where they were coming from. What certainly didn't give off those same vibes was Shayna Baszler's shocking turn in her bestie and women's tag team title co-holder, Ronda Rousey. Now, shocks can absolutely be a great thing, as we'll see shortly, but if they leave the audience more bamboozled than exciting, they're probably not for the best. Now, to preface this, perhaps this was a decision made out of necessity, as reports are stating that Ronda may be Oski from WWE after SummerSlam, so they had to rush her final feud through, and hey, while we've all wanted a Shayna versus Ronda feud for a while, do we actually want it at the cost to things making sense? Do we still want it if it feels overly forced and shoehorned? I mean, personally, not really. It's hard to get invested in a story that feels done just to check off Ronda's last WWE box instead of an extra month of helping to establish the long floundering women's tag division that would be much more beneficial than a throwaway match. Best number three, John Cena's return. As I alluded to, WWE did in fact pull off a well-executed surprise with the appearance of 16-time champ and big match enthusiast John Cena. You could collectively hear the jaws hitting the floor throughout the O2 as everyone one rose out of their seat and gave Cena one of the absolute least polarizing responses of his career. And this was probably part due to the sheer shock of seeing Cena live in the flesh unannounced, something WWE don't often do, especially with their biggest name ever. I get that you want to sell tickets and advertising big names ensures you do so, but on occasions like Money in the Bank, we was going to sell out in seconds regardless, a major surprise has just a cherry on the cake. It rewards fans who fill in the arenas and also adds a new element to attending live pay-per-views. Fans will now be thinking, well, if Cena can show up, anyone can. And that's exactly what you want. That in turn will boost intriguing your shows and add a much appreciated level of shock factor to even the most predictable of affairs. However, as great as it was, and it was, what Cena was actually there to say, not so much. Worst three, John Cena's promo. Now hold your horses. I am by no means saying I didn't love and appreciate a star the caliber of John Cena coming out and basically promising us WrestleMania London. That was great. That was exciting and electrifying by the time he got to that point. You see, as good as Cena's overall mission statement was, he did his 
share a waffling before and after, didn't he? It wasn't just John. Grayson Waller joined the fray to counter John Cena's proposal with his own of WrestleMania Australia. But by God, did they talk for a bit too long. Honestly, this entire segment was nearly half an hour hour long. That is a bit silly. As great as it was for the crowd, it turned a well-paced show into one that approached a four-hour mark. So yeah, future reference WWE surprises. Cool. Overly long promo segments in the middle of a pay-per-view. A little less cool. Best number four, the women's money in the bank match. Okay, back to the action. Despite LA Knight not getting the men's case, at the very least, we were given our first choice in the women's money in the bank match. Yeah, in a truly excellent match with an even better finish, EO Sky literally climbed over a damage control partner, Bailey, to claim the push that she most certainly deserved. And as good as that was, you know what was even better? She didn't cash the f in on the same night or on Raw afterwards. Why is it taking over five years for that to happen? While she teased the cash in on Rhea Ripley on Raw, instead, hopefully Io takes her time, picks her moment, and takes the WWE Women's Championship instead. You know, the one Asuka has. Asuka versus Sky is a dream match in of itself, and given the chaos of the women's title scene on the blue brand right now, there's undoubtedly going to be plenty of opportunities to strike. For Sky, similarly to Priest, she may have to make sure she's got one eye fixed firmly behind her own back, as a jealous Bailey will no doubt take revenge at some point. Worst number four, Cody Rhodes versus Dominic Mysterio. In a match that was built to be on par with the other two main events of the night, Cody versus Dom fell extremely flat. Something I don't think many of us expected to say, given the incredible reactions both men consistently get. And don't get me wrong, the crowd were hot for this, as predicted. They just weren't really given a reason to be hot. Ahead of the match, there was speculation that Brock Lesnar was due to show up, potentially in an angle that could even close the show altogether. There was no Brock. There was no real judgment day shenanigans to stack the odds against Cody either. No, instead Cody just put Dom away without much fuss with a single crossroads, making him look firmly beneath him. And sure, Dom is beneath Cody, but come on WWE, you could have at least made it feel like a threat was posed. Without it, this felt like nothing more than a Raw match, not on the level of what we'd expect from a marquee pay-per-view. Best number five, Gunther chopped Matt Riddle's foot. That also Drew came back. In the world of wrestling, where it seems like there are very few firsts left, it was truly refreshing to see Gunther deliver a first ever win aided by chops to the foot. Not kicks, not punches. Gunther chopped Matt Riddle's foot to death and then locked him in a knee bar for the win, punishing him for his sin of not wearing traditional wrestling boots. It was truly wonderful stuff. While I'm disappointed this match was so brief as they truly could have torn the house down given the time, it was yet another reminder of why Gunther is just the best around. The ring general's wide array of ways to finish an opponent is one of the things I've always loved about him. It adds an air of unpredictability. Every near fall could be decisive. It could be the lariat, the splash, the powerbomb submissions, you name it. Now, as good as that was, in another example of a well done surprise, Drew McIntyre made his long-awaited return, confronting the Austrian and setting up another meaty SummerSlam slap fest that has literally zero chances of disappointing. And worst, number five, no women's world title matches. As great as the women's Money in the Bank ladder match was, the whole thing felt a little off without either Rhea Ripley or Asuka on the card for the show, don't you think? Now, don't get me wrong. As I'm said, I'm glad EO didn't cash in immediately, but that's not to say I wanted it to be guaranteed that it wasn't going to happen. With Asuka defending against Charlotte on SmackDown before Money in the Bank and Rhea defending against Natalya on Raw two days later, it's just odd that WWE didn't shift one of those matches to the pay-per-view. I mean, there was undoubtedly time if you cut down the John Cena promo or cut Cody versus Tom out entirely. It could have still been included without making the show a Tony Khan level extravaganza. The intrigue of a cash-in would have aided a seemingly paint-by-numbers match like Rhea versus Natalia greatly, so why not do it? Besides, Natalia, like many other unused talents, was already there in London. So instead of paying them to enjoy nice catering, how about you showcase your women's division a bit more, eh? Hey, and that's our list. What's been your favorite or least favorite thing from Money in the Bank? Let us know. And don't forget to check out last week's little mini list right now. Collision feel like the A show over Dynamite. I've got some ideas of how they can do that. I'm still not Adam Blompier from WrestleTalk. Don't worry, I've not replaced him. He's just been very busy. And here are nine ways AEW can make Collision the A show.